All righty. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. Um, tonight is as promised. Last week I promised I was going to do something a little more positive. Um, it's a complicated because I basically, I have a compulsion. I, I sit on an airplane 10 hours a week when you're from Arizona, you know, five there, five back, and I use these news aggregators and I collect articles. And then we do follow-up and research. And I just gathered up some of them the last couple of days. These are positive things happening in our society, but one of the number one reasons I'm going to show them is there are things that actually could make our lives better, make us healthier as a society, and, as you know, my fixation on the debt. But before we start to actually do some debt and deficit, um, and I'm going to try to minimize my sarcasm, but you've you got to give me a moment here. We should be very proud of ourselves. We did something today that we've never done before, other than in the middle of COVID, but we did something very special today. Over the last 365 days, our borrowing has increased so much the last two months, we're at $80,600 a second. We broke, we did it. I was so proud of us. I knew we could actually spend ourselves into oblivion. We did it. We crossed 80,000. We're at $80,000 a second. And we're only a few ticks away from getting to $7 billion a day. So you think about the fussing that goes on here on the floor where we're, we're knifing each other for this or that. Unless it's covering almost $7 billion in savings, that day we actually went negative. So ju just a point. Um, the other thing that's also interesting in the data, um, since the beginning of the fiscal year, so you know, um, we're what, two, let's call it two months and a week. Um, Social Security is number one. Social Security is always going to be number one. But what's fascinating is I've, I've gotten picked on a little bit for bringing my chart showing we're going to have a trillion dollars this year in gross interest. You know, some folks go, well, that's not fair. They're, you're paying interest to the Social Security Trust Fund. Um, okay. Well, guess what? Even if I use what they call net interest, which is only the interest we pay out to people who bought U.S. bonds, interest is still, so far this fiscal year, the second biggest expenditure in this government. Social Security, interest is number two. And then Medicare, well, then defense, um, then Medicare, then Medicaid. So ju just some, a little bit of fiscal housekeeping there. All right. I want to talk through how, as a body, as members of Congress and our staff, I need all of us to start thinking. We live in a time where there's a technology revolution happening around us. How do we use that technology to make people's lives easier, better, give them more time? And I'm going to start with one example that, that I think is so incredibly obvious. Um, I chair oversight so, um, for Ways and Means Committee, so I have the IRS. And the number of times we've come up here just enraged that during the Inflation Reduction Act, Democrats moved an additional $80 billion to the IRS. And they tell us, well, it's for collection and customer service. What would happen if I came to you today and said, have you ever tried calling the IRS? Okay. And sat on hold and sat on hold and sat on hold or got the call saying, or, or the response saying, hey, could you call back another day or give us your phone number and we'll get around to calling you back. So I'm going to give them credit here. They tried an experiment. The IRS actually did an experiment last year. Um, actually, yeah, um, uh, this last tax season. Um, and it served 13 million people. And it was a chat bot. And most people go, oh, I don't like AI. I don't like. But think about this. When you call an airline today, do you 
most of the time, do you think you're actually speaking to a real human? What if I could call the IRS and actually have the phone picked up right then, and I can ask a certain question saying, does this, where do I put this line? I have this issue. Um, where do I find the document for this? Is there a YouTube video I can watch on how to fill out this form? The experiment worked. It was actually incredibly positive. And I'm told because I've had their technology people in my office multiple times, even last week, it's going to get expanded for this next tax filing season. You're going to get the phone answered. What happens if the ability to do a chat bot at a government agency could mean better customer service, faster, and let's be honest, save a lot of money because you don't have to hire as many government bureaucrats. It's a moment where those of us who are very concerned about that additional $80 billion going to the IRS could actually say, okay, there's an argument We've got a real customer service problem. How about using technology? Well, it's already being experimented and it's working. How do I get my brothers and sisters here when we do our oversight, when we think about our job of making government faster, more efficient, more affordable, and less borrowing? Oh, less borrowing. To say, why, what other agencies? could basically get rid of buildings full of people answering the phone and move to technology that's crisper, faster, better, cheaper, more accurate, and actually can give you the link so you can see the video on how to fill out the form. So, so these are sort of where this discussion is going. There are positive things happening, or at least possibilities, if I can get this body to think. So let's actually go on to one of the other ones that I'm absolutely fascinated with, um, and I've actually worked on this for years. Um, there's this thing called carbon capture. Most of the left despises it because it would allow you to continue to use particularly natural gas, and yet there's breakthroughs in the technology right now to capture the carbon sequester it, or convert it into other products. And I actually have a functioning a whole library of MIT and others who've had breakthroughs on how to do it. Um, facilities, like that's what this one is, um, you know, uh, being built. There's even crazy experiments going on around the country and in the world on what they call ambient carbon capture, where the concept of what happens when you can actually start to capture the carbon right at the point source, turn it into another fuel, put it, sequester it in the ground, use it for extraction of other hydrocarbons. But there's a solution here. The problem is it doesn't fit the narrative, my brothers and sisters on the left. But if you actually look at the math, particularly with 45Q, which is um, an incentive to capture this carbon, well, look, look one of the biggest emitters you have in the country is making concrete. Okay. What if you'd grab that carbon and just put it in the concrete? Yeah, the concrete turns gray, but it's a sequestration of it. The ability to think that there's positive economic growth solutions, and for our brothers and sisters on the left that have, you know, um, climate change concerns, but yet we talk past each other. But I have article after article I have saved on, you know, um, new technology could capture carbon and water out of thin air. This is the ambient carbon capture. It's out there. It exists. How do you get this body to start reaching this century of technology? Instead, we often sound like it's still the 1990s. It's here. We've actually had some of these experts, some of the researchers, the one um, MIT's breakthrough from uh, almost two years ago. I bring this because this is a particular subject area where the left wants one thing, we want one thing, and I argue there's a technology that actually solves both of our problems. So part of my point tonight 
was instead of just talking about the dystopian terror I have of the speed and growth of debt and the fact of the matter that no one wants to have the conversation with me that from today through future, most of our debt is going to be health care costs. And if in nine years we start to backfill Social Security, um, it's demographics. So what do you do to create as much economic growth, as much prosperity as possible, and then one of the number one things we have to do in time is start to talk about how do you not finance, but disrupt the price of health care. And, and I, I'm, I'm going to jump a little around on this. The ACA, Obamacare, a decade ago, wasn't a health care bill. It was a financing bill, basically saying you cover this, and here's how you get subsidized, and here's who has to pay. The Republican alternative was a financing bill. And who has had to pay, and here's who gets subsidized. Medicare for all is a financing bill. They're not about what you pay. What's the actual cost? So what if I came to you and started to say, let's actually think about the things we can do to make our society healthier, make our society so we don't need the same level of health care services. And the next board I'm going to show you is a fairly radical thought. Now, let's actually walk through this, because I've been collecting articles on this concept for a while. This last year, somewhere close to 100,000 of our brothers and sisters in America died. Number one overdose was fentanyl. Come to Phoenix, Arizona, in Maricopa County, Arizona. We have three people lose their life every single day to fentanyl. What if I came and said, hey, there's a health care solution? Turns out we're on the cusp of having a vaccine. Um, now, now, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I've read the articles. And apparently, fentanyl is just because it's synthetic is remarkable at the, capturing the receptors in your brain and, 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 and just dramatically changing your, your brain chemistry. And the concept of filling those receptors. Well, it turns out there are scientists all over the world working on this concept. If, if anyone's you know, in, industrious enough, um, uh, Google right now, or use your search engine, um, vaccine for cocaine. Different formula. It's a binding of, of, uh, to a protein. But I started following this a couple years ago when there was this article about a vaccine for alcohol addiction. We typically scream at people saying, just tough it out. You know, go to your meetings. You should do both of those. But what would happen if you could start to remove the high from some of these incredibly addictive synthetic drugs? Remember, these things are, are chemicals. They're, they're, they're not plant-based. This world is so much more dystopian. What change would happen if the homelessness in our urban areas, if this was available? How many people out there could you help back into society? It's a tough conversation. It, there, 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 there's some really tough ethical questions that come of, you know, you have someone, that, it comes in off the street, they're addicted to fentanyl, there's a fentanyl vaccine available, do they have to be able to choose it themselves? Eh, probably. When are you in your right mind where you can make that type of decision? But this is on the cusp. This is projected to be here potentially next year. Are we intellectually, ethically, financially ready to deal with the opportunity of a disruption of something that's tearing many of our cities and our communities apart? This is optimistic. This is loving people. This is also trying to figure out a way to take on human misery. How many times have you had an idiot like me come to the floor of the house and say, maybe we should start to think about policy if there's now going to be vaccines coming that actually block the receptors for these types of drugs? 
and would that be good for society? And if it would be good for society, how do we carry it out? I think this is just moral. It's just moral, besides the fact that if you actually look at the 10-year cost of it, it may actually be a huge economic benefit and savor to municipal governments, city governments, state governments, and also us in the, our Medicaid subsidies. But it just may be the right thing to do. And, and, and I, I, there should be hope. There should be actually excitement about these sorts of things. So let's actually, as we walk through a few more of these, and forgive me, there's so many subjects here. I'm going to bounce around on this one only because this is one I've been collecting for years. A couple years ago, I came across an article of some scientists that actually had been focusing on methane. Those of you who actually, actually care about math, um, methane apparently has a substantially higher impact according to the formulas we're given but a much shorter lifespan in the atmosphere. And the capture of methane was going to cost a fortune. Some of the early Biden administration rules of they wanted costs for upstream and downstream of production of natural gas. And the scientists wrote this article saying, hey, did you know clay, when it's also adjusted, I believe it was with copper oxide. And you get the joke here if anyone actually has a scientific brain. Clay, it's kitty litter with copper oxide, it acts like a methane sponge. And it's incredibly inexpensive. I proposed it to some of my Democrat colleagues who claim to really, really, really care about climate change and methane and all those things. And they just looked at me like I was a heretic because I was giving them a solution that didn't require massive government subsidies. But now, here we are a little bit later, and the articles continue on, hey, the, the ability to do the capture, and even the ability to use that methane capture in agriculture, and the fact that there's actually even some new attempts to do it, and you don't have to bankrupt us. So is it enough to come and give speeches about how much you care about climate change, and then not actually understand the science that makes it so you can do something without crushing people's livelihoods, without crushing your retirement and your next future generations in debt. Call my office. We have dozens of these articles we collect. We just subscribe to some really crazy blogs and scientific publications. But in this place, does anyone actually read the literature? This is supposed to be a happy, optimistic speech, so I'm, forgive my exasperation. Um, let's actually sort of talk through some of the other things that are going on. You all, because I know everyone was reading and enthusiastic, um, the first CRISPR drug made it through the final bit of its process and apparently is heading toward the streets now. FDA's approved it for sickle cell, sickle cell anemia. Incredibly painful. This drug will be outrageously expensive, and we need to find, for just basic morality sake, how do we make it available. But the point here is it works. Finally, we've talked about CRISPR and the ability to alter a genome and add some gene sequencing. It's here. It's been done. It's approved. It's available. One of the miseries in our society actually now has a cure. So we've actually proposed ideas of a healthcare bond, the ability to be able to buy the units, cure our brothers and sisters, and then use the future healthcare savings because they no longer have that affliction in the future to pay it back. If someone else has a better financing mechanism other than just borrowing money, let me know. But get ready. There's dozens of these types of um, pharmaceuticals, um, genetic, um, bio, other things that, that are in the pipeline that we have almost the moral obligation if it ends misery and also 
allows our brothers and sisters to once again fully participate in the society and the economy. We have to deal with these. But this is optimistic because we actually have been working trying to find a cute way to say it is cures are the solution. And this is where I, I often get in a fuss, and I'm going to spend a bunch of time at the end here on diabetes, a fuss I have with a number of our Democrat members who we, we go at each other pretty hard here because their version of morality is, let's put up more clinics to help you manage your misery. And I keep looking at them saying, will someone read the scientific literature? We're on the cusp of cures. What's more moral? Spend money build more clinics, or spend some money, get more economic growth, because you've cured. You've ended the misery. How do I get this body to see that vision, that it's great economics, great growth, and it's also moral? So let's actually walk through just a few other of these things. This is another one just really interested in. Um, they're already they've are in phase one right now. How would you feel about a vaccine, a vaccine for breast cancer? This is a brand new board. I only have a couple of the scientific papers on it, but so far, it looks like it's working. What would this mean for society? What would it mean for testing? What it would mean for mammograms? What would it mean for expenditures in the future? Uh, what it would mean for people like my wife that have gone through some misery here? Is this the right thing to pursue? Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't work. But they're well into their phase one, and the early data is great. Think about it. And you, you see, I'm trying to create thinking here. What happens if one of the ways I reduce, we reduce, future debt and spending is we ended misery, disease, cures. These are the sorts of things I wish we actually brought in front of our committees, talked about. We actually had staff that would understand the basic science. So the next one, I've actually brought versions of this to this floor for about three, four years. Even had a debate yesterday in the back of the room here when we were doing a piece of legislation that I thought was purely theater. And saying, OK, what is the simplest thing you could do tomorrow that by the end of next year, you could have a major change in spending on health care? And people look at you and go, oh, don't know. What if I told you 16%, and this has been peer reviewed multiple times, 16% of U.S. health care spending is associated with people not doing their pharmaceutical maintenance. So someone like me, I have hypertension. Can you believe that? As long as I take my calcium inhibitor, I'm most likely not to have a stroke. You know, someone that does a statin, those pharmaceuticals are incredibly cheap. They've been around for 50 years. But it turns out and this board is now three years old. Our latest number is over $600 billion. That's 16% of U.S. health care spending in a single year. Well, you're not going to get all that. But what happens if you could get 10% of it, 20% of it, by just a pill bottle cap that beeps at you in the morning or a text message you would get on your phone saying, did you take your statin? It's worth thinking about. If 16% of our healthcare spending is you didn't take your, you know, how many people do you know that don't follow their regimen on their insulin? We have technology to help each other stay on the program. Within a year, by just saying, hey, we want a pill bottle cap that beeps if it's the type of thing you use for maintenance. For grandma, the type of thing that if she has to take these in the morning, these in the afternoon, that drops the pills in the cup. It already exists. It's existed for years. We've done presentations to um, the committees around here saying, look, the data's here. We all agree this is real. Why is it so hard? 
we actually had someone come to us and present us a package saying, do you realize there's certain pharmaceuticals that are so incredibly expensive? Put them in sterile blister packs. And when someone has gone through their treatment, don't throw away what's left. If it's in sterile packaging, why can't it be you know, given to a Medicaid system or you know, helping the poor? We just don't think here. We're so used to saying, well, let's just spend more money. But please, give this a consideration. Is this Republican or Democrat? It's neither. It's just technology. But it would be a partial solution. And this is, let's see, if it's 16%, that means this is like 34% more effective than the piece of legislation we jumped up and down and made a big deal about passing yesterday on suspension. But one's theatric, one is actually a, a solution. We need to learn math. All right, here's where I start to soak myself in kerosene, play with matches. It's math. The math will always win. But I have no intention of hurting someone's feelings, but we really should start to talk through some of this. This has been incredibly well vetted. It's in article after article after article. 5% of our brothers and sisters are actually over 50% of our healthcare spending. 5% of the population is 50, actually a little over 50% of all healthcare spending. These are folks with multiple chronic conditions. Many of them have a miserable life. But our ability to change this 5% here is a remarkable savings on debt and spending and morality of people having a decent life. Why is it so hard to focus on this? So we actually have article after article after article we have been collecting. And look, for many of us, the ability to use AI to discover cures. This is happening all around us. Why haven't we updated our policy? Why haven't we worked with the FDA saying, hey, AI can produce your parts of your population statistics. So you go into your you know, phase one, um, you get certain um, data back, you can use AI to model your populations. You could cut the time bringing solutions and cures to market. Um, the ability to actually change what the concept of telehealth is. Is telehealth grabbing your phone and FaceTiming someone, or is it the things you have on your body? Is it the wristwatch you have? Soon we'll have blood glucose. Once you have blood glucose and oxygen and heart rate and those things, you functionally have a medical lab on your body. Should you be allowed to take that data, run it through, and if it can be certified by the FDA, should be allowed to prescribe. Now, this heresy I just said, but the fact of the matter, if you have data on your body, or like that flu kazoo I came here and showed on the floor what, years ago, the thing you blow into, and it's a breath biopsy. And within a couple moments says, hey, you have this virus. We're bouncing off your uh, medical records you know, so it bounces off your phone, here's your medical records, you're not allergic to this antiviral, we're going to order that antiviral, and maybe Lyft or Uber drops it off at your house in a couple hours. Would that be a good thing? Except the fact of the matter is we functionally keep that illegal. And if we don't make it illegal, we make it so it can't be reimbursed. It's a solution. Remember, part of this, part of this discussion is what do we do to change the cost and the ability to be healthy. Not who's going to subsidize your health care premium, your insurance premium. We have article after article. There's actually some miracles starting to happen here in starting to understand a, um, cell dynamics. Now, this one's a big deal. If this starts to come around in the next few years, remember, we have a certain misery in this country we've got to deal with. This sort of goes back to my fentanyl vaccine. We may be about to walk into a fifth year 
of life expectancy, particularly for prime age males, falling. Look, it's bad enough you live in a country that in about 18 years we have more deaths than births. But what happens when life expectancy in this country is shrinking? And I'm, I'm, we're going to get up to what one of the things for that. Um, how about this? What would happen if there is a universal flu vaccine? So instead of playing this game every winter saying, did they get the mixture right? Well, it's only about 30% effective because it turns out the genome of the flu that actually started to circulate wasn't the one they expected. What if actually they figured out a way to do the SNP on the protein instead of do you, have you ever seen the data of the economic impact of a major flu season, how many people don't go to work? It's really good economics, and it's, I will argue, it's embracing science in a way where it's good for all of us. And I, look, I have article after article of these breakthroughs that are actually not in the lab right now. Many of them are actually being tested. Why can't we get this body to say, hey, that one belongs getting an X prize, because if they can bring that to market a year, two years sooner, think of the misery we end. Oh, and it's really good for the budget deficit. Hey, this one, we need to work with the FDA. If we actually have to move someone over here to be able to do the review process instead of it being piled up on somewhat overworked bureaucrat so it sits there for a year, we need to think through the fact that time of a cure, the faster it comes is moral. And it's also great economics. So let's actually now go where it gets even more uncomfortable. The number of mocking I took a couple years ago, and then the science actually turned out I was right, but I never got that reporter. Um, and look, the, DCCC is always going to attack us, um, but you would think they'd actually see the morality in actually ending misery in people's lives. Diabetes is the single most expensive disease in America. It's 33% of all healthcare spending. It's 31% of Medicare. 31% of Medicare is associated with diabetes. So, a few months ago, we actually had a healthcare innovation summit downstairs. We actually got six members of Congress to show up. We invited all of them. But six showed up to meet the company that looks like they have a cure for type 1 diabetes. And, a, and the fact that the other company sitting, sitting next to them looks like they had a path for type 2. But remember, that technology, there's four or five companies, because if type 1 is an autoimmune disease, what happened if you could teach your body not to attack its cells? That one's actually, I think, heading towards its phase 1. Why, if these things are so expensive in society, why can't we actually fixate on them? <sighs> of the $327 billion spent on diabetes by by insurance and government. That's in 2017. $327 billion. We're going to knife each other around here for a few hundred million, maybe a several billion dollars of savings. Incremental changes here on just helping our brothers and sisters if we could get to a cure of diabetes. And now here's where it gets actually politically even trickier. Research exploring use of gene therapy to slow promising, shows promising results of a diabetic, met, I, forgive me, I always get this wrong, retinopathy. So I represent a population, a tribal population, that apparently, I've been told, is the second highest per capita population of diabetes in the world. And it's not a poor tribe. They're incredibly well managed. Uh, it's, they're prosperous. Um, and as we've learned now because of the GLP-1s that obesity really is, has a huge genetic component. 
you know, the, the hormones you produce to know you're full is different between you and I. What happens when even our brothers and sisters who are going blind because of diabetes? We're in the cusp of the cure there. But I would actually go even more creative. If anyone's willing to read and read something that's a little bit complex, about six months ago, the Joint Economic Committee Republicans, so these are, you know, a couple have PhDs in economics. We wrote a response to the president's budget, but we took it further. We said, think about what we could do for society if we were willing actually to do something about obesity in America. Turns out, remember how I just showed you that 5% is 50% of healthcare spending? Some of the data from The Economist came back and said, hey, almost half of healthcare actually has an association with obesity in America. Okay, this is where it gets tricky, but math is math. So in that, they did very conservative math. And they were coming up with saying, hey, you know, at the end of 10 years, that's five plus trillion dollars of savings. And if you did the multiplier effects, you might actually, you know, being able to work, family formation, labor force participation, life expectancy, you started to add in those other benefits. It could be several trillion dollars. Besides the basic morality. So how do you get there? How do you actually come here and actually have a conversation without someone accusing you of nasty things because you showed you gave it, you cared? Well, you have some new categories of drugs, the GLP-1s. One apparently goes off patent next year. Can you act, could we actually, as a policy here in Congress, encourage a co-op? Make the one that's off patent. Add competition. Crash the price. The fact of the matter is, someone like me comes and fixates on the debt. And the Democrats are there fixated on wanting to tax people more. And for the last couple of months, I've come here and showed you the academic literature over and over and over that says, you can raise rich people's taxes all you want. You hit the economic ceiling and you get about a point and a half. Maybe if the sky opened up and everything went, you got up to almost 2% of GDP. Over here, we've talked through almost everything we're able to cut. And there's only a couple percent of GDP that we could ever cut and survive, you know, to just get, get the vote. Problem is if you do, you, you take away the fraud of crediting back to the administration the student loan money, you add it all up. We borrowed almost 8.4% of the economy last year. So borrowing last year was 8.4% of GDP. Did you hear my math? If taxing rich people only gets you a couple percent of GDP and the cuts we want to talk about, and many of the cuts I'm, I'm absolutely going to vote for, but it's only a couple percent of GDP, does someone see a problem in the math? It has to happen through policy. Is having a healthier society that needs dramatically less health care, is that moral? Because it's surely great damn economics. The point of tonight's presentation is actually clear. There is hope. But the idiocy often of our, we've calcified intellectually. The left somehow thinks there's a path to tax your way to prosperity. I've tried to show repeatedly that if we did every tax the Democrats talk about to save the Social Security Trust Fund, you get close, but you still actually have very substantial cuts. I mean, when we've tried to model it, but let's say it covered everything. You've just used up all your gunpowder. So how are you going to, if two-thirds of all future borrowing is functionally Medicare, where do you get the cash for that? Because you've used it to shore up the Social Security Trust Fund. And that's actually part of the intellectual vacuousness of this place is we'll just tax more. 
but there's not enough money, but we're not going to tell anyone that because it doesn't fit what we said on the campaign trail. How many times have some of my brothers and sisters on my side, it's foreign aid. And then you show the chart that every dime of foreign aid is about 11 days of borrowing. Remember, we're on the cusp of borrowing $7 billion a day. We're over $80,000 a second now. We're going to have to change through policy. I've done videos on how you could have a revolution on environmental by crowdsourcing the data. And I, I even made a cart, whole cartoon, it's on YouTube somewhere, of crowdsourcing environmental data that if you did that, you don't need the current enforcement mechanism because if you have enough data, you catch the bad actors. It would open up the economy, promote growth, and you'd catch the clowns that are breaking the rules. And I've showed that to people around here and say, oh, but that would cut a whole bunch of jobs at the EPA. That's the point. It's better, faster, and better for the environment, and a hell of a lot cheaper and fairer. I guess my rambling in my closing, Madam Speaker, there are solutions, there are hope, but they're only going to come about if we have a, intellectually a fairly dramatic change in how we have sort of calcified on policy. Because all these things are disruptive, all these things are going to have armies of lobbyists who do not like them because you're changing their business model. Our armies of bureaucrats showing up in your office explaining that you're changing how the law is or how they are. That's the point. There's hope. It just requires us to change. And with that, I yield back, Madam Speaker. Gentleman yields back.